Welcome to channel and harmony, an harmony of life. What does it mean to live from the completeness of our being? In order to integrate, transform and heal the shadows that usually keep us from feeling true life fully. Let's listen from the silent heart so we can feel what the fullness of being is telling us. It's time to express the true divine gifts that were given to us with the seed of divine conscience which was planted in humanity. So we don't need to lose ourselves in ideologies or ritualistic camouflage for everything begins with a direct and sincere contact with this divine conscience that really dwells in our presence. For only in the fullness of being are we healed and transformed. In Him we live, move and have our being, says the scripture, Acts of the Apostles 17. And as I explained in previous episodes, the root of all of our problems is that we lost awareness of our completeness. And despite this completeness has its roots uh, in a very deep being we can barely feel, completeness always begins by seeing our shadows, shedding light to integrate them into a view of true understanding, allowing them to be dissolved and liberated by the beam of divine light which anoints us with conscious love, the fullness of truth, spontaneous life and serenity. These gifts uh, must bathe our psyche, which is our mind and emotions, but it also must bathe our fallen spirit, the wind wheel that got trapped in the flesh and turned against life. And this is how we begin to remember the perfection of being to which we really belong, in spite of the state of imperfection we live. For let's not forget that today humanity is not what it should be. The human soul was hijacked many thousands of years ago. And if it is difficult for us to feel the perfection and completeness of our true being, it is because we are taught to see and think negatively, to feel lack and adversity, to pay attention only to internal and external chaos. We are forced to be afraid of our physical, emotional and spiritual nakedness, our vulnerability. Since childhood we all have been insulted beaten, lied to, we have lived uh, painful situations that made us feel rejected, not loved, and thus the psyche got traumatized, confused, forced to conceal her miseries with external covers, and since the psyche does not want to see her own darkness or be rejected by it, she projects it out. That's why she fills the world with toxic waste, blames others for everything, organizes religious, political and scientific sects, and thinks she needs to gain material things to be rich, to put on makeup in order to be beautiful, tattoos to be cool, have a partner to be complete, change gender because she does not like it, the one she has, and who knows how many things more. In this fallen world, everything got fragmented and deformed. Humans don't even understand the true feminine qualities, such as receptivity, the capacity to suffer, to open a space, to include, share, and unite. But humans also bypass the true masculine qualities, such as subtle attention, the discernment from the false and the true, and forced discipline, 
the wheel of life, all of which are always oriented to solve conflicts and protect us from the transgressions against our true essence. And lacking these qualities within is what breaks everything outside. That is why the world we see is in chaos, full of division, violence, intolerance, whether in the form of social conventions or politics, science, religion, morals. Humanity in general became dominated by passions, with a mind obsessed with controlling, possessing, imposing or changing things by force. The feminine and the masculine got perverted into the hands of the strange woman, fallen Adam, as Hebrew wisdom calls it. The human soul marries and mixes with everything she likes without discerning what comes from the authentic being and what comes from false gods, Mammon, the god of riches, Pan, the god of passions, Moloch, the god of sacrifices, Hermes Thoth, the god of this supposed wisdom which eventually became the science that separated from life and tried to reconnect by means of monumental megaliths but without success. This was the fallen wisdom, Sophia. And today it happens exactly the same with technological cities where everyone gets sick and there is poverty on all levels. Actually, two-thirds of the world population live in extreme physical poverty, not just spiritual poverty. And all in spite of the sciences, arts and supposedly advanced technologies. Now, since ancient times we are told in great accounts that the human soul was hijacked by forces and beings that rule this world and want to make humans their possession and source of food as well, like parasites do in nature. This is why we read in Genesis chapter 3 that for the serpent dust will be its food. Let's remember that the human soul was formed from the dust, afar, which actually means stardust. Even Carl Sagan said we are stardust. But as long as men and women are dominated by their own emotions and minds without discernment, their stellar essence will be the food of a reptilian mentality known as the serpent. Precisely what makes people feel incomplete, fearful and helpless is this serpent mind that was implanted into the human DNA, the tear Yeshua speaks of in the parable of Matthew 13. However, divine being managed to use this trap in its favor. Later we'll see why. The serpent, we must understand, is a proud, egotistic and intellectual energy that eats and eats but never gets satisfied, seeking pleasure without measure, hiding reality, trying to be always an independent ruler. And she is very judgmental. This is why in Greek she is also known as Diabolos, accuser, which in Hebrew would be Mechatrek, and also Shatan, which means adversary. And we see this adversary in the mind that says God punishes, men are male chauvinists, Women are hysterical, my parents are a for me. Cancer is bad and we have to eliminate it even with wild radiation or chemicals against life. I do not like my body, I want to change it, and so on and so on. 
and very few realize that this proud spirit of lack and adversity is what makes us fearful and sick, especially if we already have a seed of divine conscience apart from the seed of the serpent. And this is because divine light gets hard perceiving darkness. This is why remorse arises, remorse of conscience, as it is known. He was wounded for our transgressions, but with his stripes we are healed, said prophet Isaiah. A passage that was misinterpreted because it does not refer to the Roman Christ, which is rather an external character. But this passage refers to divine conscience within us. To see where we heart the divine being in us is the true way to healing. The problem is that our fallen psyche gets frightened and rebels against true light, hiding itself in order to escape remorse. And this generates such an emotional tension that weakens and sickens the body. This is why Apostle Paul said, Do not grieve the spirit of holiness with which you were sealed for redemption. And the tension is even greater in those where the seed of light, the spirit of holiness, has developed to a point of forming the anointed mind, the spirit of truth, the masculine pole of divine conscience, which is more aware of transgression. We must understand that the spirit of truth and the spirit of life, eventually, must merge with our old emotional psyche and also with our fallen spirit, which once was divine but became contrary when caught by the serpent mind, trapped within bodies that have reptilian genome. So now it must be separated from darkness and reintegrated into true life. Scriptures compare it to grafting a fallen branch into the tree of life. This is why the anointed Yeshua said that he came to bring the sword and not peace. An internal rebellion always takes place when true light comes. And of course this refers to those who already have the seed of divine conscience. Because if someone does not feel remorse seeing the own transgressions and shadows, maybe he already has a seared conscience and has been infested by a luciferic reptilian mind. And this has almost no solution, since purification means going through the sword of conscience and get darkness fully dissolved. And very few are willing to go through this test. The real tragedy is that the divine spirit given to humanity became soulish, dominated by the pride that separates. And from this pride derived uh, the religions and wisdoms of the world, fallen Sophia. So the only way out is to recover the feminine qualities of a heart that humbly receives the masculine qualities of the Divine Son, whose anointed mind brings the spirit of truth and eventually the spirit of life that marries the human spirit and psyche, rescuing them and making them a living spirit, masculine in relation to the world of passions. As Yeshua said, ironically, referring to Mary Magdalene, I will make her man, a living spirit. Those who already have the seed of divine conscience transmitted by the universal anointed one of salvation only need to feel and descend from the inner maiden the virgin 
consciousness that is not contaminated by the ideas that fragment everything in opposites, such as religion A versus religion B, good against evil, doctors against illnesses, free will choosing good versus evil. By the way, free will is an illusion, since divine will is overwhelming, and when we really feel it, we can only obey and love without restriction. And true awareness, true consciousness, does not think of causes generating effects, because everything flows. All these views belong to the delusional world, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which dominates human culture, in which morality, religion, art, science, politics usually express uh, the great deception of the fallen soul spirit. True art and true science are very rare in this world. The waters on which the harlot sits are people's crowds, nations and languages, says the book of Revelation. For example, the idea of causes and effects comes from Aristotle. However, the true sages sought uh, for a non-fragmented reality that flows like a wave. Everything is one, said Parmenides. Everything flows like a river, said Heraclitus. And the same is found in Hebrew wisdom. Listen, Israel, the qualities of divine being, unicity are. Deuteronomy 6. In Hebrew, this Shema prayer is known as Shema Israel, Hashem Elokenu, Hashem Mechat. And feeling this oneness is really to eat from the tree of life where the right and left sides of the tree of knowledge no longer exist. They have been dissolved or reconciled into the central column of the tree of life, called the eternal sun, where there is harmonic beauty, known in Hebrew as Tifereth. In Greek it would be koinonia, communion, and harmonia, which, by the way, is a word made popular by the wise Heraclitus and also by Pythagoras. But I would not use the term harmony, because harmony includes the root harm, and harmonia is not harmful. Harmonia in us begins by aligning mind and body under the anointing of true love, light, life, and peace. An anointed mind is always in tune with the body. It does not fight against it, but it does not let the body do what it wants either. Feeling the body without rebelling against pain and suffering is the beginning of healing. Let's simply Acknowledge that uh, there is pain and suffering because we have broken the flow of life because of the spirit of lack that makes us eat more than necessary, desire more than we need, talk and think too much. But it's also due to the spirit of division which goes against life, against women, against men, against everything. And this is why it's preposterous to fight against cancer, against gender violence, against poverty. It is what we hear in, in the media, but it's just more a spirit of adversity. Healing, integration and abundance begin by unifying the true masculine and feminine within. If we remember from previous episodes, head and body, mind and heart, were represented as man and woman. That's why in the Hebrew wisdom we hear that Eve was Adam's body, flesh of my flesh and bones of my bones, as he said. 
Now, as Apostle Paul wrote, the Father of Lights is the head of the Anointed One, the Anointed One is the head of man, and man is the head of the woman. And this must be read uh, on several levels. On one hand, the woman is us, humanity, because we are feminine in relation to the divine. And man would be the mind anointed by the divine brain, the mind that must illuminate the emotions without trying to control or dominate the body, because the body finds harmonia naturally when it's clothed with true light. And the anointed one would be the collective divine brain that wants to take care of our psyche and physical bodies, which are his vehicle of expression here on earth. Now, the teaching can also be read on the level of social relationship between man and woman. This is why Paul wrote that husbands should also love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, because no one hates his own flesh, but nourishes and cares for it, just as the Anointed One also loves those who are called because we are members of his body. Ephesians 5.29 Now, when there is no connection of the Anointed One in man and woman, humans separate from each other and from nature and annihilate each other, as it happens today all over the planet. Conscious and subconscious split apart and become slaves of the satanic unconscious that seeds destruction and suffering all over the planet. The external catastrophes and wars that we see are a great reflection. Now, when divine light falls on our spirit of division, those contrary tendencies begin to evaporate and our fallen spirit gradually unites with the spirit of truth and the spirit of life. And this is how we are reintegrated back into the tree of life, like fallen branches. As I said, the coming of the spirit of truth and life, which is the coming of the Anointed One, the Messiah, is not in the future but when we recognize him in ourselves, in the form of humble conscience full of love and light and understanding, we recognize him when we are like him, said the apostles. And this helps us recognize the faults in us and others, but without condemning it, helping them to transcend. Only then can we have reconciliation which in Hebrew is known as tikkun, rectification. And here lies the secret of Yeshua revealing the Gospel of Thomas, the key of uniting inside and outside, above and below, man and woman to enter the kingdom. This means to realize there is not an abstract divine supreme on one hand, the world and us on the other. This is known as fallacy of abstract monism and fallacy of dualism. Rather, there is divine oneness, unicity, a heart. Pretending otherwise is leading us to monstrosities and nameless suffering. As the Master said, the kingdom of heaven is within you. In the Gospel of Thomas, Yeshua even says that the kingdom is inside and outside of you because the inner and outer worlds are a mirror of the truth the truth of how we are and how we feel everything we hate outside is a reflection of the hatred towards ourselves outer chaos is a reflection of inner chaos however it can also help us remember and begin to express the fullness of being because true light always shines 
when darkness is present and transform it. As the scripture says, the anointed one learned obedience by what he suffered, Hebrews 5. And we know that for those who love the divine being, all things cooperate for good, in those that are in accord to his purpose, Romans 8.28. In the book of Job, uh, we also hear that even the adversary, Satan, is the servant of divine being. Servant in the sense that when something hurts us, it becomes the esteem that forces us to be humble and receive the truth that helps us understand pain, feeling increasing degrees of completeness, until the pain is gone in the tree of life. This is why it is not a good idea to demonize our body diseases or problems. We must see them as an opportunity to recover our true being in the oneness of the tree of life. There is nothing wrong with feeling pain, fears, resentments and weaknesses so long as we recognize them as what they are without trying to hide them with excess food, judgments, pastimes, chattering. We must feel and remember as much as we can the complete presence of being that comes in search of us to save what was lost, as the scripture says. Because only in his light of understanding can darkness be dissolved. This is what means to become anointed. For in him we live, move and have our being. And thus we see how inadequate are the attempts to connect with the living being by artificial means, with fallen practices, meditations, with labels or even repetitive prayers, because as the Master said, this is what the hypocrite Pharisees did. All religions and forms of self-development hide some form of the pride that separates the fallen psyche and spirit of this world. On the contrary, the Master taught that true worshippers worship in spirit and truth. And to worship in spirit and truth is to recognize oneness from the silent heart, from the virgin consciousness uniting with the anointed mind that discerns the true from the false. And this is already at our disposal. We just need to pay attention to him, to love his original teaching of light. Or we can continue with religions, with politics, fallen science, and see the partial, see ourselves as guilty or victims, separating ourselves from others and from nature. But let's remember that entering the kingdom of heaven, the Malkut, Ashamayn, is to regain our complete original nature, and before we die physically. Otherwise, we fall again into the tree of knowledge of good and evil and everything starts again. And when we begin to regain awareness of our completeness in the tree of life, inner wholeness is reflected on the outer world and then even our body becomes younger and gets healed because it mirrors the perfect divine image of our true being, who is complete, lacks nothing. This is why Yeshua said that in the ascent to the original state, known in Greek as anastasis, and wrongly translated as resurrection, beings neither marry nor are given into marriage, but are like the divine messengers in heaven. Matthew 20.30 and these messengers are no others than the new anointed spirits of life that come to incarnate and flourish here on earth, dissolving the duality and returning everything to its original state before the fall. As we read in Revelation 19, 
the anointed one is followed by armies sitting on white horses, which means on clean psyches, and dressed in pure linen, which are the right works for which we are born. And this is why Paul said that by receiving the seed of the anointed one of salvation, we are immediately seated on celestial thrones. In the next episode we'll see that all this leads us to a completely new vision of reality and our belonging to divine family. But for now, remember that in spite of all of our miseries and shadows, having heard and felt the life teaching of the anointed of salvation, Yeshua, we have received his seed of conscious love that seeks to help Others find perfection, the light of integral truth, spontaneous non-artificial life, and increasing serenity. And therefore, we have all the necessary gifts. We only have to nourish that seed with the heart and mind that follow the thread of truth, being illumined and healed by the new spirit of life. In him we not only find healing and forgiveness of our transgressions, but we can forgive those of others, which means to distribute gifts around us. Even the Master's prayer says, forgive our debts as we forgive those who offend us. And let's also remember that as the divine name grows within, with all the gifts, we can establish an intimate relationship with the Anointed One of Salvation who brings together the souls of men and women from the cosmic brain into the cosmic fabric of his body, connecting us to the will of infinity. And thus the Son of the Infinite becomes our true master and best lover as well. After all, he is our highest self. I hope you like this episode. Remember you have links down below to a web of vital orientation and a blog. Leave your questions and comments if you wish. And may the peace of being be with you all. See you next time.